Good morning, all. Uh, greetings from Hobart, uh, where I'm giving this uh, recorded presentation at, I think, four in the morning. Um, I'm hoping that you will not be watching this video because I will be in um, I will be in Perth next week, and hopefully, we'll be giving this talk um, uh, live at some early hour of the morning. So, uh, my task for this meeting was to talk about recruitment modeling uh, with a touch on tuna fisheries. I'm not a, really a tuna fishery person, except when I review stuff. So um, my focus is fairly general in this presentation, but many of the general issues related to um, recruitment apply uh, equally to tunas as to many other species. So recruitment is obviously fundamental to any population and population ecology in general. There are a number of areas where um, uh, estimation of recruitment comes in. Um, and I'm going to touch really on only a couple of those. My focus is really going to be on the second of these issues, how we estimate um, recruitment uh, with a focus on estimating absolute abundance. Um, but I will talk about um, recruitment in the context of uh, data limitations, um, and I'll hopefully define what I mean by that, given that most assessments of tuners are in the, in the data-rich spectrum. Um, and similarly, I'll talk about reference points. Um, Estimation of recruitment generally is complicated, particularly if you want to estimate a stock crude relationship, which um, uh, from a best practice point of view is obviously something we want to do. Um, and um, the issues here, of course, are that um, for many species, the data are very uninformative about either the, the shape of the stock crude relationship, let alone its parameters. So um, let's take that a little further. Um, and take a little bit of a um, a tuna focus to this. And um, I, I see tuna assessments as unusual in the sense that there's usually a lot of data, um, particularly length frequency data. Uh, but that doesn't mean, in the words of Yoda, that a reliable assessment this does make. Um, because often length frequency data are very uninformative about cohort strength, which of course is of direct relevance to estimating stock truth relationships. Um, they're also uh, a general um, aim of starting the assessment quite early on. I often see 1950. Um, what that means is there's many years of um, the population reconstruction that doesn't um, that doesn't have any length frequency data. Um, and of course, um, for many stocks, I'm thinking skipjack in particular, there isn't really contrast in in abundance, uh, which would allow us to estimate the stock root relationship, uh, let alone its parameters. Um, so uh, here is just an example. I'm actually not sure what stock this is anymore, uh, but you can see all the um, different data types, and, and in particular, lots of catch and lots of length frequency. Um, the column on the right is weight frequency data, which are even less informative about um, cohort strength than, than length frequency data. And I think, you know, as we think about stock and recruitment, uh, think of this comment by John Shepard that aim of fisheries management is not to discover the stock root relationship. You don't really want to go and drive the stock to low abundance and find out what it is. So what am I going to talk about today? Uh, well, firstly, um, how do we estimate recruitment? What about the stock root relationship? Uh, which recruitments should we be estimating in um, tuna assessments? How does this affect projections and risk analyses? And what about uncertainty? So um, there are a number of ways to get estimation wrong. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of them. They are going to be covered in other talks during the, the workshop. Um, and in particular, um, what about when the model starts and what do you assume about it? Uh, obviously, the earlier you start, the more assumptions you need to make either about the state of the stock when it started or what recruitments to estimate. Uh, it's related to when the first composition data, and here I'm tending to think about lengths, um, and then there are some complexities related to seasonal models and spatial models, both of which um, occur uh, in some tuna fisheries. So how did I sort of take our approach to this? Um, I did a mini meta-analysis of recent assessments. Um, so I asked many of my colleagues, and I thank those people who got back to me, uh, looking at uh, the, the um, the more tropical species, uh, or the albacore is not that tropical, I guess. Uh, but you'll notice the southern bluefin is not there because its assessment is very different from the, the others. Um, so things I was looking at here were stock crude risk steepness, sigma r, bias correction, and which um, which parameters were, were estimated. 
Um, and uh, also just to say, I didn't um, look at assessments that were done using job, uh, Jabber or something like that. I was really focusing on the age structure assessments. Um, I just note that little red comment there. Thanks to IOTC, I found their assessments to be the easiest to find the assumptions because they had a nice table of specifications and I'd encourage that. Uh, it would be even better if a CTL file had been included, but you can't ask for everything. Well, you can, but you don't get it. So here's a general model of recruitment. Um, okay, so um, what I did here was I tried to explain the various components of recruitment that you could take into account. I, this is not the most complicated stock recruit relationship ever, but you'll notice that um, there are various components at the moment. I'm assuming there's their lack of interaction generally, but the factors that I've tried to incorporate here are the spawning stock biomass effect, the sex ratio consequences, the spatial distribution consequences, and also the seasonal consequences. So um, there are a lot of different ways to, to cut this particular cake and um, just some uh, sort of background stuff here to be to start with. Um, you know, how do we um, specify things like um, spatial and temporal variability? Um, I'm going to really focus on the, the, the um, temporal variability, in other words, the annual deviations rather than necessarily the, the spatial deviations, but how you do that is obviously going to be important. Um, what I haven't seen, and obviously since this is not well set up for this, is spatial um, order correlation in um, uh, recruitment deviations. You can build that in in, in synthesis using uh, the way it, it uh, specifies the um, uh, uh, settlement functions, but I, I didn't see a lot of detail on that. Um, so let's start with the um, the first component of my my general equation, the, the biomass effect. And so um, when I looked at the assessments, so what did I see? I saw that most assessments use a bevan holt stock root relationship. They fix the steepness parameter. Um, and importantly, um, this is consequential because I see that many assessments report SMSY and FMSY. So if you're going to do SMSY and FMSY, you really do need to consider your uh, form of the stock root relationship because as noted in the right-hand page, there is a fundamental relationship between those parameters and the assumed steepness parameter. In the case of um, Clark's work, he didn't use steepness per se, but um, that concept does come through. So let's I'll identify for each of these topics I'm going to cover what I think are um, uh, best practices or at least good practices. So the first for um, for for the stock root relationship itself, um, given um, that you, one often finds there is very little contrast in um, in stock and recruitment for for tuna species, I think it's important that. Um, sensitivity be explored to different types of stock root relationships and, and usually hockey stick is, is one that I don't see used as much as perhaps it should be. The second is it's always good to attempt to estimate steepness when you can and, and I'm a great fan of, of doing that um, uh, particularly with a prior on steepness uh, and if nothing else that allows that uncertainty to propagate it into, um, into the estimates and hence the management reference points. So um, just fixing steepness is um, is really underestimating the extent of, of true uncertainty for at least the reference points. Um, a more uh, controversial, particularly if you use synthesis, uh, um, is, is to use the alpha-beta parameterization of the stock root relationship rather than the R0 steepness one. And the reason for that is the concept of time-varying steepness is not a real thing. Um, and so if we are looking at changes in productivity over time and in the form of the stock root relationship, we really need to think about um, how this how this plays out. Um, and that's perhaps a, a, something beyond this workshop, of course. Um, the other thing I've noticed that even when steepness is fixed, it is lack of consistency among tuner assessments. And, and I'd suggest that um, there be some work done to sort of, if you're going to fix it, let's have a common set, particularly at a species level. Um, and then remarkably, I didn't see very many attempts to plot stock and recruitment, even to ask the question whether there's any evidence for a stock root relationship. So I think that's also good practice. Um, so one of the questions that always arises is, um, which recruitments should we estimate? So this is not a tuner assessment here. This is, uh, I don't even know what it is. 
Um, so most assessments didn't estimate all of the, the um, recruitment deviations. They could, some did. Um, they all pre-specified sigma r, uh, and the range was remarkably wide, ranging from 0.3 to 1. Um, and again, there does seem to be a lack of consistency there. Um, and then most applied some form of bias correction, but not necessarily a ramp. Um, so um, I would my the good practices or best practices that could come out of this workshop would be uh, working towards a protocol for consistency in which recruitment deviations to estimate. I prefer to estimate more rather than fewer. Um, there were some assessments that were thinking about estimating sigma r. Please don't do that um, because within the context of a penalized likelihood framework, that estimate is negatively biased. Uh, and we know that. Uh, paper by Mark for uh, 20 years ago shows that um, the best estimate of sigma r is zero. Um, and if you do some arithmetic, you'll find out why. And then the other best practice is to account for the, uh, uh, the effect of estimation error on um, bias correction and using the, the bias ramp. Um, again, I didn't see that. You can't do that in my um, multi-fan CL, so they're, they're forgiven. Uh, but um, it's always good practice to, to try to estimate the bias ramp, or at least imply a bias ramp. So just to re-emphasize, um, the sigma r, is, it's important. Um, it, has, it directly affects the um, bias correction. Um, People want to solve this problem by putting a prior on sigma r. Well, that doesn't really solve the problem because you still end up with negative bias. Um, and the other thing that's coming out is um, looking at um, uh, recruitment deviations and their correlation. Um, and I would suggest good practice here would be to um, would be to have as a default um, the um, uh, the the autocorrelation the stock root relationship. So um, bias ramps, talking a little bit more about there. Um, obviously, if you're using a random effects model or a Bayesian model, you don't need to worry about the bias ramp, um, which is good, which is another reason why you should be doing it. Um, for the bias ramp, I tend to uh, follow at least the principle behind R for SS and apply no bias correction uh, when there's no evidence uh, for information content and this left the right panel suggests there's there's at least that blue period there where it looks pretty dubious and then of course applying full bias correction where there is um, uh, really good information and again you can see that uh, in the um, right hand panel here so just reminding that this is not inconsequential if you get sigma r wrong uh, depending on how informative your data are you can end up with uh, incorrect estimates of R0 because of that negative correlation between sigma R and, and R0. So um, I just want to touch very quickly about regime shifts and dynamic B0 because everyone loves dynamic B0 these days. Um, dynamic B0 actually is most common in assessments of tuna species, far more than other taxa. Um, uh, that said, uh, I didn't see a lot of evidence for regime shifts being modeled. One assessment did, uh, but only one. Um, but I'm not sure that the others even looked at that. But that said, there's a lot of evidence uh, in the literature for regime shifts in the paper by uh, Cody Suswalski uh, looking at across a large number of texts. So um, what is the good practice? What should we be doing? Um, Ideally, uh, we should be basing our reference points on whatever the current environmental and ecological conditions are. This is words from the Magnus Act. But the difficulty with this here, both um, for tune assessments and more generally, is the lack of objective methods to assess whether such a regime shift has occurred. And um, several times before, I've already made uh, calls for um, uh, calls for uh, a more objective basis to be come up to be uh, to be just established. There's a paper by Neil Clare. Um, I put out table two, which is a, the um, the sort of guidelines. I think that's a slot. Oh, it's ten years old that paper now. And I think we could probably do a little bit better in terms of not just tuners but um, marine taxa more generally. So uh, environmental covariates are starting to be uh, very popular in assessments. There's a lot of call to include environment in our stock root relationships. Just to remind you, there's two basic approaches. One is to add the environmental covariate to the stock root relationship directly, essentially inferring that it affects the slope at the origin. Uh, but it does make the assumption that the uh, covariate is measured without error. 
The second option is to treat the covariate as data. Uh, this is intuitively um, pleasing because it implies that there's measurement error, which of course there is. Um, but the cost of that is that sigma nu parameter where you need to specify how good the uh, environmental index is. So two different approaches there. Uh, spatial models very quickly. Um, <clears throat> there, they seem to be a, um, a geographic uh, tendency to use or not use spatial models. Um, both stock synthesis and multifan have been used for this purpose. Um, but that said, uh, when I looked at the assessments, it was really hard for me to understand what the logic was that led to which spatial deviations were were estimated. Um, this was the big eye, um, the big eye spatial distribution. So, um, what are the best practices here? Yeah, now, this um, uh, it's a huge topic, obviously dealing with spatial models and. I'd suggest that um, anyone who's interested look at the Good Practices CAPM um, workshop and what um, we talked about there. Um, and of course, Aaron Berger will be talking about spatial models at, at your workshop, so maybe listen to him. Um, again, I tend to prefer to estimate more parameters than fewer, uh, and that's again to allow uncertainty to be propagated. Um, that said, um, where possible and from first principles, uh, rather than the estimate was low, um, thinking about areas for which recruitment does not go to uh, and, and fixing that so that you don't end up with um, oddly bizarre results. Um, and again, um, touching on a point I made earlier about spatial temporal correlation in spatial deviates, which I don't really see much of. So the estimation framework, um, most assessments, in fact, all assessments, I think, um, were estimated within penalized likelihood. So basically fixing sigma r and estimating the rec devs and other process errors. Um, the best way to go, obviously, is to move to um, either a state space or Bayesian approach and allow um, sigma r to be estimated. Uh, that said, I did some simulations for the Kaplan Good Practices um, workshop a couple of months ago and found that when you are fitting to uh, length data, uh, there's still a tendency to underestimate sigma r. So that's the upper panel here. You can see the bar I've indicated with the error. Um, there is some negative bias in sigma r when you fit to conditional age of length data. But with ages, um, while not exactly unbiased, uh, it's pretty good. Uh, and also your ability to estimate sigma r and dare I say most other parameters deteriorates when there is um, uh, model misspecification. So um, touching on here on penalized likelihood um, and true state space models, so how do they differ? In fact, there are many cases there. The structure of the model is the same, same penalties and that sort of stuff. Uh, but the difference, of course, is that the uh, sigma r parameter, whatever the weight parameter that determines the variability in the random effects is estimated, not pre-specified. Um, and um, currently we use the sort of method method and Taylor approach to spec to set the sigma r and associated parameters. Um, that's not a bad practice, but it's certainly not the, the best practice. And the best practice is to treat things as random effects um, and deal with them there. So what about some diagnostics? Um, there, um, there are, of course, many diagnostics we look at in assessments. Um, there's a recent paper that uh, talks about looking at uh, recruitment deviations and whether they exhibit patterns that would suggest uh, failure to um, achieve, satisfy a runs test. And hence, that's something in the assessment is misspecified. Um, this is uh, Southern Bluefin Tuna. This is the rec devs. Um, uh, that is not going to do very well on a runs test, uh, which suggests that the structure of the model um, the, of the recruitment deviations isn't quite correct. Um, note that you could probably re rectify a lot of this with uh, autocorrelation. Maybe that was what was in the uh, likelihood and it just wasn't plotted. Um, but it does look um, suspiciously uh, like something is going on that the model is not capturing. Um, another warning um, I'd like to make is that when you plot recruitment deviations, you often see odd outliers. Um, I can't remember which assessments had those. Um, but what I call those, those are mathematically selected. So the, the model generally wants um, pulse of small or large or whatever fish by the time the first length frequency arrives. And just given the mathematics of the penalized likelihood, um, it, what it usually does is says, I'll stick all those recruits into one uh, one year class. Um, and um, magically, it does everything it needs to do. But you end up with a very bizarre um, 
uh, recruitment deviation pattern and hence um, assumptions about sigma r. So projections. Um, well, I've already mentioned it, but basically if you're going to do uh, projections, you need to have a stock root relationship. It does not make sense to do projections based on constant recruitment simply because there's sort of no point because why would you do, why would you care about biomass if it doesn't affect recruitment? Um, I believe that we should be propagating as much uncertainty as possible. Um, uh, I would also highlight the AD nuts package that is now available for Woodley stock synthesis. I don't think it's available for um, a multifam. Uh, I've used that and it's been pretty successful about estimating parameters like sigma r um, and also the parameters that relate environmental conditions to environmental, uh, sorry, recruitment to environmental factors. Uh, on the right hand side, I show you some projections of spawning biomass um, for, this is for COD in the North Pacific uh, under different climate models. And so um, just highlighting the importance of understanding or at least postulating that uh, expected recruitment could depend on uh, factors outside of uh, our control, in particular non-fishing related activities. So um, as I wrap this up, um, a little ahead, so that's good. Um, you don't want to watch my face for too much longer, I suspect. Um, what about uh, multiple stocks? So I haven't really talked about multiple stocks yet. Um, uh, then if you do, uh, you need to start thinking about global versus local density dependence in the stock root relationship. I haven't touched on that here. It's, it's very much an area of um, uh, research. Um, and um, the only package I know of who can do this properly is Gadget, which is not used for any tuner assessments that I know of. Um, the third point, um, uh, second point, sorry, is data poor. There's a plot on the right-hand side from some work by Jason Cope. Um, for data poor assessments, there's this tendency to, well, when in doubt, simplify. So if you um, if you don't know anything, if you don't have a lot of data, you basically say, I will assume that recruitment deeds are all zero. Uh, and that's fine and good, I guess, mathematically. But it, what it can end up with is that you end up with the bizarre situation that data poor assessments are actually more certain, or at least perceived to be more certain, than data rich assessments, which doesn't seem right to me. And then I haven't touched on the uh, sex specific recruitment. I didn't really see much evidence that that's being considered right now. And uh, given the nature of the data, which tends to be sex aggregated, it's hard to imagine that there'd be much um, uh, evidence to be able to support such specifications. So in conclusion, um, what I am um, advocating is a couple of things related to the stock roof relationship. Uh, right now we're using Bevan and Holt, that's, that's fine, but I think we could do better. We're essentially looking at more stock roof relationships and ideally um, selecting, weighting them. Um, although to be honest, I suspect we have to carry many of them forward. Uh, estimating steepness, um, it's good practice to estimate, fix it. I would say you need to look at a range of parameters, but ultimately you want to try to estimate all of the stock root relationships. Recruit deeds, um, I've already hopped on this many times, uh, we should be estimating those random effects, uh, but we, you know, good practices, uh, use a penalty function, but with a bias correction and all that bias ramp and that kind of thing. Sigma R, um, yes, I think you should be estimating it. Uh, sigma R, um, at the moment it's been fixed for meta-analysis, but as I noted earlier, I think it's important that as a community, uh, you come up with what are um, standard values to use by taxon, because I think right now there's a little too much uh, flexibility in the way those are done. Bias correction, yes, um, you can do it, good practice, but obviously uh, you don't need the bias ramp. Uh, you do need bias correction, of course, if, uh, if you take, adopt a state space model. And with that, I will stop. I am currently in Hobart, so none of these pictures apply, but hopefully when I uh, give this talk uh, electro uh, non, well, be electronically, but electronically somewhere else, um, I will be in Perth. Um, and um, I look forward to talking to you. Thank you.